So using the Clapeyron equation in example, what we're going to do is we're going to use it to estimate the slope of the solid-liquid phase boundary for water, where we're given the enthalpy of fusion of 6.008 kilojoules per mole, and the densities of ice and water are 0.091671 and 0.99984 grams per centimeters cubed, and those are the densities of ice and water, and we're also given the molar mass. And then once we do that, once we calculate that slope, we're going to then estimate the pressure that's required to lower the melting point of ice by 2 degrees Celsius. And so the one thing I just want to just draw or sketch in here first is the phase diagram for water looks something like this, where we have solid, gas, and liquid phases. And so what we're trying to then describe with the Clapeyron equation is this line right here, or at least that's what the question is asking us to figure out, is the slope of that line, because that's the boundary between solid and liquid. And so we're looking at a temperature of around zero degrees, so that's going to be somewhere right here. And so we're basically sitting somewhere around here on the line, since we'll assume we're at one atmosphere, and that we're just trying to figure out the direction of that line, or the slope of that line around that point. So starting with the first problem, and if we start with just writing down explicitly the equation of the Clapeyron equation, which is dp over dt, and that's equal to the enthalpy of the transition divided by the temperature times the change in molar volume of the transition. And so here, when we're talking about trying to find the slope of our line, remember that our axes here are pressure on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. So in essence, what it is that we're trying to determine is dp by dt. That's the slope of the line. And so if we can then calculate this enthalpy of transition, we know the temperature, and we know the molar volume um, of the transition, then that means then we can actually calculate then the slope of this line. For this example, we're actually given two of these numbers already. We know that this is 6.008, and the temperature we're acting at is 273.15 Kelvin, because we're going to be at zero degrees Celsius. And that's what the problem specifies here and here. So the only thing we need to figure out is what is this molar volume of the transition. And so to do so, we'll, we'll expand this term where we'll say the molar volume of the transition, well that's equal to the molar volume of the liquid minus the molar volume of the solid. And so the one piece of information that they gave us in this example was that they gave us densities of the ice and the water. And so what we can do with the density is that if we take the inverse of the density, well, we know a density is a mass per unit volume. And so if we take the inverse of that, that gives us a volume per unit mass. And if I multiply that number by the molar mass, which is grams per mole, then what I'm left with is volume per mole, which is a molar volume. So all I need to do then is I just need to take these densities, take the inverse of them, and multiply them by the molar mass of water, which is the value that's also given in this problem. So let's do exactly that. So that means we'll look at ice first. I'm going to take the inverse of the density. So in this case, I'm going to have 0 0.91671 grams over centimeters, or sorry, with centimeters cubed on top. So I have centimeters cubed divided by the 0 0.91671 grams. I'm going to multiply that by the molar mass, 18.01529 grams per mole. And then finally what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert the centimeters cubed into meters cubed, just so I'm operating in um, a more um, distributive of units being, we always want to operate in kilograms, meters, seconds. And so I'm just doing that conversion right here. And so one meter cubed is the same thing as 100 centimeters cubed. And so if I do this multiplication and divide out all the correct numbers, I end up um, canceling out grams, I end up canceling out centimeters cubed. And what I'm left with is a value in meters cubed per mole. In this case for ice, it's 1.965 times 10 to the minus 5 meters cubed per mole. And again, remember what we're trying to calculate, in this case what we're finding is the molar volume of the solid, in this case being ice. And here I have a molar volume. I have meters cubed, which is a volume, divided by moles. Let's do this for water now. 
I'm going to start again. I have my centimeters cubed on top. I have the density, or sorry, the mass on the bottom, 0 0.99984 grams, times the molar mass of water, 18.01529 grams per mole. I'm going to do the unit conversion again, 1 meter cubed divided by 100 centimeters cubed. And so the result of that operation is 1.802 times 10 to the minus 5 meters cubed per mole. And so again, what we're trying to calculate is this change in molar volume of the transition, which we've defined as the liquid minus the solid. So if I'm going to do that, then I'm going to do delta trans of the molar volume. And the liquid is 1.802 times 10 to the minus 5. From that, I'm going to subtract off 1.965 times 10 to the minus 5. And what I'm going to be left with is negative 1.6318 times 10 to the minus 6 meters cubed per mole. Well now we're pretty much done because we've now been able to figure out what this value is and that value is negative 1.6318 times 10 to the minus 6. And so now we can just plug in those three numbers and we're going to get our value. So dp by dt is equal to 6.008 and in this case, I'm going to write this in terms of joules, and you'll see why in a second. So that's why I'm writing times 10 to the 3. On the bottom, I have 0 degrees Celsius, 273.15 degrees Kelvin. And then I also have my negative 1.6318 times 10 to the minus 6. What that leaves me with is dp by dt is equal to negative 1.348 times 10 to the 7. And on top, I had joules. On the bottom, I have Kelvin meters cubed. Now, you might be asking yourself, what happened to the moles? Well, remember, the value of the enthalpy of the transition was kilojoules per mole. And, then, and that's what a value that I have on top. And then also, I had my molar volume had moles, or basically meters cubed per mole, the volume per mole. And that basically canceled itself out. I had mole per mole and those two terms disappear. The other thing that I want to do here though is I'm also just going to move around units just so that we can turn our units, this joules per kelvin per meter cubed, into something that looks a little bit more applicable to our plot. Because remember, our plot over here, well, it's in a plot of pressure and temperature. And pressure is in pascals and temperature is in kelvin. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to rewrite this answer this negative 1.348 times 10 to the 7. Well, I know joules are a newton meter. And so I'll change the joules to newton meter. Here's my kelvin, here's my meters cubed. I can then cancel out a meter in one of the meters on the bottom. And what that leaves me with is meters squared. Well, a meter squared, this is just an area. And if you remember before, when we talked about pressure, a pressure is just equal to a force per unit area. And so in reality, what we have here is negative 1.348 times 10 to the 7 pascals per Kelvin. And so expressing it in this way, and again, this is why I made some choices in terms of units back at the beginning, for instance, changing this into meters over here for the molar volume, that's what leads us to this final result where we actually have something that's in pascals per Kelvin, which then directly relates to our diagram over here where we can talk about our PT or our pressure temperature phase diagram. Let's now look at the second problem here where the problem is asking us to estimate the pressure required to lower the melting point of ice by 2 degrees Celsius. So first we're sitting here at 1 atmosphere and 0 Kelvin and we're on this line which represents the equilibrium point. And what the question is asking us is where do we go on this line so that we can get to the point where we have now decreased our temperature to minus 2 degrees Celsius. And that then represents a new pressure where we have this new dynamic equilibrium. What we have right now is we have a slope. We have this dp by dt, and that's equal to this negative number. And this negative number tells us that the slope is a constant, which is good because we have a line that's on our phase diagram right here. 
And so if we wanted to then calculate where we're going to go up the slope, well, if we know the slope of the line, then we can just integrate and we end up with our position. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. So I'm going to slide this up. So for problem two, what we're going to do is we're going to rearrange and I'm going to then set up my equation. So here I've got the integral of dp and that's going to be equal to the integral of negative 1.348 times 10 to the 7 dt. And so here all I did was I just multiply both sides by dt and then I'm going to integrate. My bounds of my integration, well I'm starting at 273.15 Kelvin. I want to know what it is when I drop by 2 degrees, so that becomes 271.15 Kelvin. We're at 1 atmosphere of pressure, so that's 101 times 10 to the 5 Pascals, because remember this value that we have this in, this is in Pascals per Kelvin. So it's important that we write these bounds in terms of those same units, so this needs to be in Pascals. And the second part to this of the above bound, well this is just that new pressure, the one that we don't know or the one that we're trying to solve for. And so by evaluating these two integrals and then solving for the final pressure, we're then going to know where we're going up the slope of that, that line. These integrals are very simple to calculate. The integral of dp, well that's just equal to p, evaluated between pf and 1.01 times 10 to the 5. The integral of some number times dt, well it's just going to be equal to that number, negative 1.348 times 10 to the 7 times t value between 273.15 and 271.15. If we evaluate these or utilize the fundamental theorem of calculus, then on the left hand side I get PF minus 1.01 times 10 to the 5, and that's equal to negative 1.348 times 10 to the 7 times 271.15 minus 273.15. And so in the end, when we rearrange, we get PF is equal to negative 1.348 times 10 to the 7 times negative 2 plus 101.01 times 10 to the 5. And so what that's equal to is 2.706 times 10 to the 7 Pascals. Now this number in and of itself probably doesn't mean very much. However, if I were to convert it to atmospheres, so 1 atmosphere, 1.01 times 10 to the 5 pascals, that number is actually 268 atmospheres. So if we were to put a pressure equivalent to 268 times whatever pressure we feel here at sea level, then that is what is required to then change the melting point or the freezing point of water to ice by two degrees or lowering it by two degrees. Let's look at what it means for the Clapeyron equation to predict a positive or negative slope for the solid liquid phase boundary. In the left plot we have the phase diagram for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a normal liquid where the phase boundary between the liquid and solid phase has a positive slope. This means that as the pressure increases, liquids will spontaneously turn to solids, which is the intuitive thing to happen. Anomalous liquids are when the slope of the solid liquid state boundary is negative. As can be seen in the phase diagram for water on the right, the negative slope between ice and water indicates that it is an anomalous liquid. What this means is that as the pressure increases, ice turns to water. Water is the main solvent that supports life. One of the many reasons why this is true is that it remains in the water phase below zero degrees Celsius at elevated pressures. One example is Lake Vostok, which is the largest of Antarctica's subglacial lakes. Four kilometers below the ice, researchers have found this pocket of water that has persisted for millions of years. It is theorized that it persists because water is heated by the Earth's core and is insulated from the cold surface temperatures by the ice. However, the water is still calculated to be at negative 3 degrees Celsius and remains liquid due to the high pressure imposed by the weight of the ice above it. It is hypothesized that unusual forms of life could be found in the lake's liquid layer, a fossil water reserve. Lake Vostok contains an environment sealed below the ice for millions of years in conditions which could resemble those of the ice-covered ocean of Jupiter's moon Europa and Saturn's moon Enceladus.